Good evening. Welcome to a new series of Strange But True. We'll be offering you tales of the mysterious, the extraordinary and the paranormal and putting them to the test. Nearly all of us seem to have had such experiences or know someone who has. A sighting of mysterious lights in the sky, an encounter with a ghostly apparition or perhaps a vivid premonition. The sceptics naturally claim we're still waiting for definitive proof that any of these phenomena actually exist. But if a paranormal event was to be caught on camera, would that be enough to provide conclusive evidence? And in over a hundred years of photography, surely by now there must be such an image. Just before Christmas 1996, over 800,000 people flocked from all over the world to gather outside an office block in Clearwater, Florida. What they saw caused many of them to faint, become hysterical, or claim to have had life-changing experiences. They lit candles and left gifts and donations of over 20,000 pounds outside the building. Their pilgrimage had been inspired by this image on the glass-fronted structure. To some, it was a simple trick of refracted light, but to others, it was the manifestation of the Virgin Mary herself. A case of believing what you see or seeing what you want to believe. Dr. Roger Green is an expert witness in assessing photos and video images. I think the, the explanation is relatively simple. Um, if we drop uh, some oil on some water, we get what's known as a colour fringing effect. It's due to the way the light falls on the surface and is diffused and reflected from that surface. It's a classical scientific phenomenon. The Freeman's Guild dinner at Coventry's 14th century Guild Hall. A pleasant enough scene, but on closer examination, there appears to be a rather sinister guest saying grace at the top table. No one recalls seeing the hooded figure on the night. I don't think it's a hoax. Certain things about the image which are strange, and I think it's a curious coincidence of events whereby a one person standing here is in front of another person in white who could be uh, a waitress or it could be the ghost of a knight in armour. It's all a matter of interpretation, and this is, in a sense, the uh, mystery of the picture. This picture was taken by a vicar. Would a man of the cloth be so mischievous as to invent a ghostly presence in his own church? I find it an interesting figure, not least of which is uh, certain inconsistencies about it as far as what might be called common sense is concerned. But optically, if we look at the figure here, we can see, if we look very carefully, there are in fact what seem to be specular reflections from a pair of glasses. And if we use image processing techniques even more, we can actually home in and see what appears to be an eye behind the piece of cloth. In addition, I find it rather strange that the monk figure has decided to cover his head with a piece of cloth anyway. So the whole thing is just generally rather implausible. Video is not so easy to tamper with. This footage was shot by a bird watcher in Yorkshire. It was only when he watched the video at home that he noticed two spectral figures in the background. Well, I have to say it gave him the creeps because I was quite uh, surprised to see some what appeared to be figures within the, the field of view. Where the figures appear to be is actually a quite a dangerous area. It's a, an old sewerage uh, bed about 30 feet deep in unmentionable material. And these figures appear to be standing right on the spot. It's almost an impossible situation physically because I've been to the site taking photographs and it's not possible to stand in any way where those figures have appeared. Any explanation of the picture remains unforthcoming. More recently, the phenomenon of crop circles has provided a new mystery. Could video evidence be used to prove that paranormal forces are at work when they are created? Just a few hundred yards from a crop circle, what appears to be a silver object hovers over some fields. Some claim it's connected. Well, to me, it doesn't look like any kind of UFO. In fact, it looks more like a bird. It could well be a seabird because it's moving erratically and it's got perhaps glossy wings which reflect the light in a manner not unlike uh, a metallic object. In this video, the moving white objects are seen by some to be UFOs in the process of creating designs in a cornfield. For 34 years, Peter Southurst was a technical expert at Kodak, where he examined hundreds of so-called paranormal images. That was one of the most bizarre um, pieces of film that I've ever seen. It's unusual to actually see a crop circle uh, be, actually being produced. I don't think I've ever seen one uh, or heard of one being produced before. We're seeing some kind of um, electrical uh, device hovering around the field and then suddenly the crop circles appeared. One problem is that the identity of the person who took the video is a mystery. 
But what if footage is supplied by a reputable source like NASA from a space shuttle camera pointing at the Earth? Nick Pope was guardian of the real-life X-Files on UFOs at the Ministry of Defense. This is a fascinating piece of footage. Uh, what we're looking at here is three objects which are apparently rendezvousing with each other. This is interesting because the astronauts are, are zooming in on this. So if this was just something natural and mundane, why the interest being expressed? The three objects which form a sort of triangle uh, look to me to be some form of specular reflection. And as the camera zooms in effect on them, they change their configuration because of the change of the optical path. So they're most likely internal in some way. To the system. This is a famous photograph taken uh, from an aircraft over Costa Rica in 1971. Again, it appears to show a, a disc-shaped craft. It certainly seems to be pretty big, but it was only in the picture for about one frame, which means that it was going very, very fast. I was an aerial photographer at one time, and one of the things that can happen uh, when you're taking photographs from the air is that you get things dropping off. So I think we're looking there at something which has fallen from the aircraft, you're still within a few feet of the aircraft, and has been imaged by the camera as it's gone down. There are thousands of images which are alleged to feature visitors from outer space. Some could simply be saucepan lids, reflections, or even a well-placed button. Others wouldn't be out of place in an old B-movie. 90% of these unidentified images on film can be dismissed as different types of aircraft or natural phenomena. But is some footage worth more detailed inspection? Since 1991, Mexico has been home to hundreds of sightings like this one. And this one, seen on the same day as the total eclipse of the sun. I think we were looking at um, something which was a weather balloon, which comes down, changes shape, revolves and, and there's a whole variety of uh, contortions as it uh, comes down to, down to Earth. This doesn't look like a weather balloon to me. Weather balloons uh, fly fairly steadily up through the atmosphere and then drift on the wind and then come down to Earth. This, this appears to be hovering. It's no weather balloon. Here we've got a truly remarkable piece of film footage. Uh, clearly shows a structured craft uh, moving slowly across the screen uh, with apparently a, a flashing light on the underside. Now, some of the skeptics might say, well, this is uh, an airship. But the flight paths of these airships are well known. As it happens, no airships were confirmed to have been airborne at the time. Earlier this year, there were reports of the most stunning UFO video ever seen. It was apparently enough to convince an insurance company to pay out a million pounds to a man called Joe Carpenter, who claimed he'd been abducted by aliens. But there was something about his story that seemed just too good to be true. I went to Swindon, Wiltshire, with a couple of my friends. We have a small UFO group called Majestic. We got spare batteries. We are armed to the teeth with all manner of high-tech gear, camcorders, binoculars, in order to do a sky search to see if we can find or observe any uh, strange phenomena in the sky. But for two hours, nothing happened. Suddenly, the torches flickered. Oh, great. We can't be the batteries, they're new. Joe? Joe, where are you going? I felt this, this weird force pulling at me. He's not listening. Joe! Joe! Come back! I saw this bluey glow, triangular object. All of a sudden, I was hit with an intense beam of light, and I was lifted off the ground. I then awoke. I was in an extremely surreal place. The only way I could describe it was um, a dome-like structure. And I saw a shadowy figure. It looked like dolphin shapes. My camcorder was still running. Uh, and the next thing I remember is that I was once again falling to the ground. Joe! Joe! I'm recording it. We have a claim, and there's an 80% likelihood that we will be paying that claim. That was our simple object. The man in the audience was Simon Burgess, managing director of insurance company Grip, who'd covered Joe against alien abduction. He claimed the video evidence had convinced him to pay out one million pounds. As the story hit the headlines, Joe was flown all over Europe to give his account. Eventually, things got 
way out of control. I had phone calls from France, Germany, all over Europe, Canada, Australia, America, the whole world and his brother wanted to interview Joseph Carpenter. Now, I couldn't handle this. Friends, family, people from off the street were asking for money. Eventually, uh, I thought I have to tell the truth. This is uh, too much for me. Joe finally admitted the whole story was a hoax. Joe Carpenter is, in fact, Joe Tagliarini, a family man from Enfield. His real video archives consist of nothing more unusual than sightings of his son, Luke. I created the alien uh, abduction insurance certificate basically as a, as a novel thing. Um, I had a, a friend in the insurance industry. I did the, persuade him that it, it would be in his interest and mine to participate in the hoax of claiming to have paid out a successful claim of uh, one million pounds. My main objective was to see if uh, people really did believe, and they did. Joe still goes on regular sky watches with his friends and he's promised to let us know if he has a real close encounter. But I think next time we'll need a little more than his word on it. There is a theory that everyone on this earth has a double, a doppelganger. The chances of you meeting your double are fantastically remote, unless, of course, you are an identical twin. They've always held a fascination for the rest of us. The idea of two people, yet only one genetic blueprint, is almost as if the same person is in two places at once. Tonight, we tell the story of two sets of identical twins whose extraordinary bonding seems to transcend all the boundaries of normal relationships. Sherilyn Ring and Lindsay Brady are identical twins born in 1960. Throughout their lives, they've experienced a series of bizarre and painful coincidences. We were in a friend's garden, playing on those swings like kids do, having a good time. And we both fell off the swings at exactly the same time. And we both cut our tongues open, and Mum rushed us both to the hospital. We're all fascinated to watch twins in action. They seem to kind of mirror each other's movements. They finish off sentences for each other. They have the same mannerisms and so on. There is a definitely a very special psychological relationship there. Even as the twins grew up and apart, they shared a common bonding in the experience of pain and discomfort. This took a further twist when Sherilyn went into hospital to have her first child. What followed suggested that one could now transmit her physical condition to the other with surprising but unpleasant results. After being in labour for about six or seven hours, the midwife decided that it was best to have an epidural to ease the pain. So in comes the anaesthetist and there's everybody in there, they fix up the epidural and the labour is progressing, I'm still getting terrible pains. Nurse, I can't stand this anymore. It was evident that the medication was having no effect on what? Sherilyn. However, over 250 miles away at Lindsay's house, it was a different matter. My legs started to feel Johnny. very, very strange. A very strange sensation Johnny. came over them. The numbness sort of crept down my legs. Johnny, I can't move! Johnny, Johnny, come and help me! It appeared as though Sherilyn had transmitted the desired effect of the drug to Lindsay. But having done so, she now exposed herself to the impending pain of childbirth. Get me some help. Quite disturbing the fact that she had the pain relief and I'm sat there having the baby with no pain relief. This empathy was not diminished even when Lindsay moved to Hong Kong. Now a new dimension was to become apparent when she was admitted to hospital with symptoms which were diagnosed as needing urgent and serious surgery. But was Lindsay again just expressing Sherilyn's condition? I had the hysterectomy in the October. The following day, the doctor came and he said, Mrs Brady, we have actually taken out a perfectly healthy womb. If we'd have had more time, we could have prevented this by hormone treatment or whatever, but because of your condition, because you were so ill and anemic, we had to do something quickly. My first thoughts were, oh my golly, Sherry's got the, got the problem. In the January of the following year, I had my hysterectomy. Um, and even on the morning when I was having the operation, the specialist said, 
we really don't need to go through with this. And I said, yes, yeah, I insist. When I came round from the anaesthetic, he came back and he said, you know, good job we did this. Um, my womb had a severe endometriosis. At times, I feel that it's pressure on us both because if one of us is feeling unwell, then the other one's going to feel it. Over the years, I've definitely felt more pain for Lindsay than Lindsay's felt pain for me, which is um, annoying, really, because it's enough having to put up with your own pain without having to feel hers as well. And I do sometimes worry that if we were to ever have something seriously wrong with us, both together at the same time, what the effects on both of us would be. It's, it can be a curse because you sometimes don't know what you're feeling, whether it's yours, whether it's hers. Can Lindsay and Sherilyn's ability to experience each other's feelings be explained by non-verbal skills acquired in their mother's womb, even though they can be thousands of miles apart? If it is because they spent a large part of their formative years in close proximity, then how can we explain in our second case the remarkable coincidences that occurred to twins who were separated at birth and did not meet for 30 years? Barbara and Daphne were born in Hammersmith Hospital in July 1939. Their mother, Helena Jakobson, was an unmarried Finnish au pair who had come to England to give birth to her illegitimate children away from her family and shame. The twins were given up for immediate adoption, but no family could be found that was willing to take both girls. So they were adopted by separate families of very different social and economic backgrounds. Their upbringing could not have been more dissimilar. Barbara was brought up in a working class family in the west of London. There was very little income from their father, a council park gardener. Daphne was raised in comfortable surroundings in Luton. Her adopted father, a professional man, able to provide every advantage. However, the girls were to share much in common. I um, went to school, it was St Paul's School. The education was very, very poor. I didn't even pass my 11 plus. I left school at 14 and I went to work for Derry and Tom's. I failed my 11 plus for the second time and I left school just before I was 15 and in the August I started work. I came down to Dover because my stepsister was here and we went to a town hall dance. It was Christmas time. I think it was Christmas Eve when I met him. I met uh, my husband at a town hall dance. They have a um, annual Christmas dance and I met my husband there and he walked me home. I got married in October, which is sort of an autumn wedding. And I think I was a bit unusual because I had a wedding dress that was blue, but it had white lace over the top. And it was a very nice wedding in Dover. And we had, um, the scene was blue and white, which I thought was pretty unusual at the time. In the mid 1970s, Barbara first saw her birth certificate and discovered that not only was she adopted, but because the time of the birth had been recorded, that she was also a twin. There followed a long and arduous battle with bureaucracy in her search to find the twin she'd not seen for over 30 years. Eventually, Barbara was allowed to write to her sister in the hope of making personal contact. She now found herself in the position of coming face to face with her own living mirror image, Daphne. The question ran through her mind, what would her sister be like after all these years? The meeting was arranged at King's Cross Station. The meeting was rather strange. I wasn't necessarily nervous. I was a little bit excited. The train pulled in and Daphne was right in front of me. And she opened the carriage door, she said hi. Um, we didn't kiss, we didn't hug, there was no need. And we wandered off the platform chatting away. We forgot about our husbands, we'd left them behind. Reunited after 30 years, Daphne and Barbara began to discover all the similarities in their separate lives. Got married, uh, then sort of a few months after that I had a miscarriage. Uh, then I went on to have two boys and a girl. I had a miscarriage unfortunately and um, then I had two sons and a daughter in that order. 
I'm not interested at all in politics. I don't like politics. I don't vote. When I was 15, I was working Derry and Tom's store and I fell down some stairs. Oh, I think I first started falling down stairs when I was about 14, 15. Therefore, if I go down some stairs, I've got to hold on, or at least touch a rail. I am pretty worried about stairs and I do hold on. How could Daphne and Barbara have shared so many experiences over the years without ever having known of each other's existence? Basically, we are quite surprised, I think, at the degree to which things like preferences do seem to be genetically determined. But the fact that they are means that even with twins who are separated at birth and reared apart, they will quite often follow quite similar life courses. Now, Barbara. The sisters travel to America like to assist research into is, twins. I'd like you to write a sentence for me. Oh, One experiment in particular stood um, out. Anything you want. And I sort of panicked. I thought, oh, my God, I've got to write a sentence. So I wrote, the cat sat on the mat. But unfortunately, it didn't come out like that. It came out as the CAS, C-A-S, sat on the mat. And how are you Then today, it was Daphne's Daphne? turn. OK. Right. Now, the first thing I'd like you to do for me yes. is I'd like you to write a sentence for me. Because you don't really know what sentence to write, so it has to be short, not meaningful and deep. So I wrote... Well, I hoped it was going to be the cat sat on the mat, but when it came out, it came out as the cat sat on the mat. As a matter of routine, Lindsay and Sherilyn visit the doctor and say, "My sister is feeling unwell. Please, can I have a checkup?" An amazing story, but for them, it's part of everyday life. Good night. Many old buildings in Britain which have their history written in blood, but even among these, the mansion in tonight's story is special. It's a matter of historical record that Littlecote House in Wiltshire was once the setting for a terrible murder. 400 years on, those who know the house well claim that this dark deed is a legacy which reverberates down the ages. <laughs> In over 700 years of continuous habitation, Littlecote House in rural Wiltshire has been owned by only six families. Littlecote has witnessed many events in its turbulent history, and all have left their mark on the building. One of its most notorious owners lived here in the 16th century. His name was William Darrell, but his reputation earned him the title Wild Will. One dark night, a local midwife, Mother Barnes, was called to the house with the promise of high reward if she would attend a lady who was about to give birth. Conducted up six steps of stone, she passed the hall at the 20th stride, mounts one and 30 glossy stairs, and lo, the bandage is untied. I sent for you to do your work. Do it well and save the lady. If you succeed, you will be well rewarded. If you fail and the maiden dies, then you too shall die. You have a beautiful baby son, my dear. Well, woman, so you've succeeded. My lord, you have a beautiful son, but he has no clothes to keep him warm, save his apron of mine. I have no use for this child, nor any other child. 
I bid thee dispose of it with all haste. Oh, my lord, I beg of you, let me take him and care for him as if he were my own. I will say nothing. You have my sworn word on it. Give me the child. <laughs> Die. <laughs> Let guilt, shame, and sorrow die with you. <laughs> Whilst Mother Barnes was attending to the lady in the bed, she took a cutting of the bed hanging. She was blindfolded again, taken down the stairs which she counted, and back to her cottage where she was given a bag of cold and told to keep her mouth shut. She went into her cottage, but her conscience started to niggling away at her. And next morning, she decided to go to the magistrate and confess what had happened at Littlecote House. She was able to match the bed hanging, and Darrell was arrested. Darrell was quite an influential man and was able to bribe a judge to get him off the charge. While out riding, Darrell met an early end when a ball of fire from the sky caused his horse to rear. He was thrown and broke his neck. Oh. A curse on them. Damn them. Damn them all to hell. This unhappy story was recorded by John Aubrey in the 17th century and also features in Sir Walter Scott's poem, Rokeby. After Darrell's death, Littlecut was seized by the then Lord Chief Justice, Sir John Popham. Darrell had used the house as a bribe to get off the charge of infanticide. The identity of the mother was never established. Locals believe she may have been Will Darrell's sister. Despite Darrell's curse, the Popham family held on to Littlecut until 1929, when Sir Ernest Wills bought it. Lady Wills believes that the legacy of Darrell's deeds may live on. To me, the house was very friendly, very nice, and I really enjoyed living there. But a lot of people who came had some very strange happenings and experiences. One night, I was in my room, and I heard footsteps coming along the corridor, and they stopped at the door, which was very strange, because I thought somebody was coming in. It sounded as though somebody was just walking along and coming into the room. But nobody came into the room, so I thought, well, that's my husband. So I threw open the door and there was nobody there. When my daughter told me about the footsteps, I wasn't in the least surprised because I had heard the same footsteps many and many a time when I stayed there. Uh, I told her it was rubbish because I didn't want her to be frightened. But one night I had been reading and I lifted my eyes and suddenly there was someone standing at the foot of the bed holding what I took to be a child over her shoulder. She was gazing at me, and I gazed at her. We didn't speak, I didn't speak, but she just looked, and a look of calm and peace came over her face, and with that, she faded away from the room completely. And fame reports the lady comes with babe of fire at dead of night, but harmless to the innocent, they come to see that all is right. I was at the bottom of the cantilever staircase and looked up and suddenly a figure glided along the brown landing and it was that of a lady. She was obviously very young and her fair hair was blowing out behind her. It was a split second to see her, but I've never forgotten it. In 1985, Little Cut was sold to entrepreneur Peter de Savary. He took it on together with all its worldly contents, but he believes he also inherited a rather unworldly aspect of its more recent past. When I saw the house and I liked the house, I decided to hell with the ghosts. I'm going to buy the house anyway, and uh, nothing's going to uh, put me off or frighten me. It was a lovely sunny morning, uh, about nine o'clock, and uh, I was on my way out to the garden because there we were holding an auction uh, of the contents of the house. And as I stepped into the hall, uh, I suddenly saw a lady coming towards me. She was dressed in modern country clothes. And I do remember thinking at the time, gosh, which room did she come out of? She looked straight at me and she said, you are a very evil and wicked man. And she was looking straight at my eyes and I was taken aback and I said, I beg your pardon. What do you mean? And she said, you have taken my baby's things. 
They were in the wooden box in the chapel. They belong to my son, and you have taken them away to be sold. And she again stared at me without smiling at all or flinching, and she said, Please put them back in the chapel. If you don't, you and your family will be cursed and damned forever in this house. I suppose I could try and find them for you. And she looked at me and she said, And if you do put them back where they belong, you and your family will be blessed forever. And just at that moment, she smiled and she was gone. She was just gone. I was white, I was trembling, I was a man genuinely possessed with uh, fear. Something very unnatural had happened that morning. De Savary quickly found the box in his house. And as I held the box and looked at it, I realized that I had had an experience very few people have ever had. I was holding the baby's clothes and I had been speaking earlier in the morning to the mother, who had come back as a ghost in modern dress with a modern look. I took the box, I went to the chapel, I put it on the window ledge from where it had been taken, said a short prayer in the chapel, and told the auctioneer, the sale may now commence. 10 years later, de Savary sold the house to Warner Holidays, the hoteliers. But even Warners insist that the box should remain where it has always been. I'm utterly convinced I saw a ghost that day. I was cooking for a meal in the kitchen for the de Savary family and all our staff were in period costume at that time and uh, I see somebody go past me and go into this little room outside of the kitchen. Mary? Mary? I said to Mary, who was working at the kitchen sink, where have you been Mary, why have you been out of the room? And she said, I haven't been out of the room at all. She said, I've been here all the time, which of course she must have been because there was no other way out of the kitchen. So I was quite convinced then that I'd seen a ghost. John had just gone down into the cellars. I was here, nobody else in the house. And whilst I was pottering about here, I heard footsteps up above. I thought, that's strange. John's just gone into the cellar. So I dashed upstairs, went through all the rooms up there, not a soul about. About a year ago, I was up in the attics checking things on a Saturday night and was coming down in the Jerusalem stairs, which I've been up and down hundreds of times, hundreds. And I was halfway down the stairs when suddenly I was crashing against the wall. I broke my shoulder, my collarbone, and my ribs, and I don't know what happened. I didn't slip, I wasn't pushed, and I didn't fall. I was just suddenly wham. This isn't an evil house as such, but that day, something evil definitely did happen. I've never, ever experienced that feeling in the house before. It really left me frightened. Whatever the truth about the claims, these strange events as documented in the poem about the little cut ghost suggest that the spirit of wild will may live on. Whilst Darrell's wretched spirit, tis said, as if in magic circle bound, oft by benighted rustics seen, the fatal spot to wander round. Today, Littlecote House has been converted into a hotel with a capacity for up to 400 guests. Well, those are the paying ones, at least. Some cultures take the view that, being close to the skies, mountains are suffused with magical properties. To them, the highest places in the world are a meeting point between heaven and earth. The ancient Greeks believed the summit of Mount Olympus to be the home of the gods. And Tibetan folklore tells of a mountain Shangri-La where men become immortal in a land of eternal youth. I like the sound of that one. In our second story tonight, mountain rescuers turn to the mystical forces of a cold and forbidding alpine peak. The Bavarian Alps boast Germany's highest peaks, just the challenge for keen skiers and old friends Steve Swindlehurst and Ian Middleton. In February 1994, they came to Oberammergau, 
to tackle the infamous Mount Laba. We decided to set out around about 3 o'clock. We looked at it to think that it was going to be about a 25-minute journey from top to bottom. It is a black run. Um, it's powder and pieced, um, and this is quite an awesome run. When we actually got to the top of the mountain, we did actually find that the fog was starting to come in, um, which uh, lowered the visibility. Both good skiers, the two men had no fears. Ian, a former army ski instructor, went first. Despite the weather, the going was good. My father-in-law told me about the skiing on the lava, of how difficult it was, and that it was a real challenge, and that Ian and I should have a go at it by the end of the holiday. We'd skied down about 150, 200 metres on a fairly steep slope. Halfway down, we realised that the, it wasn't a piece that we had obviously made a wrong turning. We, and then we realised that we were actually off piste and skiing in terrain which was quite dangerous. The two men tried to find their way back to the marked out piste which would lead them down to the safety of the village. But then disaster struck. <laughs> what I'd done in fact was break the binding clip. So when I tried to lock my ski back down again, it wouldn't close in the boot and it was unable then to ski any further. By now well and truly lost, they attempted a new route towards the village, this time on foot. That was when it started to get a bit hairier. And on a couple of occasions, we came to what were, in effect, sheer cliffs. Um, the snow just dropped away into nothing, and you couldn't see the bottom. And the whole time, both Ian and myself were getting more dejected that we weren't going to find the, the slope. It was now getting on towards 6 o'clock in the evening and getting dark. The rest of the holiday party, waiting in the village below, had become worried. Ian and Steve were now seriously late. <laughs> Okay, Oberammergau's mountain rescue team were scrambled. With the temperature set to plummet to minus 20 degrees that night, the rescuers knew the men would only survive for a few hours. We went down all the official pistes first of all, then we separated into groups and went down the unofficial trails all the time calling and shouting to try and find the two men. But there was no sign of them. Of course, the darker it got, the harder it was to see where we were going. And I guess at about 7.30, 8 o'clock, we realised that we weren't going to get down that evening. By now, the two men had strayed into dense forest. I don't think we ever got anywhere near that piece. Well, whatever it is, we're not going to find it now. We're running out of daylight. Yeah. We're all the action, man. What are we going to do now? Build an igloo? At the time, both Ian and myself didn't really appreciate how cold it was getting. We realised that if we were to sit in one place, it wouldn't be the best way around to do it because you may just sit there and freeze to death. Surrounded by trees, there was little chance of the men being spotted by the rescuers. But as the search party gave up and headed back to the village, there was someone else concerned for their safety. 70-year-old George Horak has lived in Oberammergau all his life. He's an acknowledged expert on the mountains which encircle the village. But George is also a dowser. By holding his divining rod over a map of the mountains, George claims he can tap into their energy and sense what is happening on the slopes. I could feel what they felt, trapped at night on a mountain in the dark and cold. I could feel the danger they were in and that they were afraid to die. The rod showed there was something broken. I didn't know what was broken, it could have been a leg. I could also see they were sitting underneath something which had to do with earth. But I could not think for the sake of it what it could be. Some sort of shelter. Suit couple. Despite their physical exertions, Steve and Ian were starting to suffer from the bitter cold. They're bound to find us sooner or later. Yeah, hopefully sooner, before the gangrene sets in. Come on, more branches. The important thing is to keep moving. Man can't see entweder Erfrierungen holen on verschiedenen Gliedmaßen. 
One can get frostbite on feet and toes, on the fingers or nose and ears. The whole body gets so cold and the body temperature sinks so low that the heart stops beating. Let's have a nip of that brandy in. I'm freezing. Just a tiny drop. Dinner. Yeah. Oh. still feeling in my fingers. Let's get out and move around. We shouldn't rest in one place for more than ten minutes at a time, anyway. It's at those times that you begin to feel the worst. You wonder if you're going to survive the cold, if the rescue people are going to find you in the morning. Alone on the mountain, the men had no idea that a village dowser might be their last hope. George Horak relied on the reactions of his divining rod to guide him, as he plotted what he believed was the men's exact latitude and longitude on the mountain. I told the mountain rescue team where the men could be found. Then they went back up again. I returned home, hoping that the men could be found, even if not in the place where I thought they were. The mountain rescue is grateful for all advice and investigates all the information they get. We did not think about if the advice was wrong or right. If we get advice, we follow it up. rescue people's torches shining through the trees was absolutely amazing the sheer sense of wow we're going to get out of this and we're going to get out of it now we i guess it was then that the adrenaline stops working and you suddenly realize a how cold you are and b how tired you are as soon as mountain rescue found us and they came down and they had hot sweet tea for us to drink is we were shivering like absolutely shivering all over oh. i was absolutely shaking like a leaf Steve and Ian were brought down to the village cold but unharmed. It was only later that they learned just how serious their predicament had been. We were speaking to the mountain rescue the next day and I was trying to explain to this guy what we'd done, the way we'd built the shelter, the working and the resting, the thing that we'd done all the way through. And he disregarded really what I, I was saying and said, it, you, you would have died. You would not have come down off that mountain. You would have been dead. It wasn't until they were back home in England that they learned about George Horak's role in their rescue. I was fairly sceptical about the whole thing. It wasn't really until I'd heard stories about the mountain rescue team doing one last run and going to an exact area pinpointed by the dowser that you realise that there probably is more to dowsing and alike than you realise. Well, I'm glad he did it. So I'm here. <laughs> um, it, it's it, we, we were told at the end of the day what he did with with this with the dowsing rod was like uh, getting a needle out of a haystack three years on steve has his hands full with his 13 day old daughter emily i can remember ian when we were sitting on the mountain um in one of the quiet moments saying that he's got two young boys and they're he was absolutely adamant that he was going to come down. There was no way he wasn't. And I guess with my arrival, it, yeah, it puts everything into perspective. Some would say it was no more than a stroke of luck which enabled George to locate the skiers. Perhaps the real test would be whether he could do it again. So far, rescuers have not needed to ask him for more help, and they hope they'll never have to. 
Good night. Good evening. The death of a body is not the end, the soul lives on. So followers of the Jewish faith believe. The Quran promises that the pious and the righteous will be in delight, and the wicked disbelievers will be in the blazing fire. And Christians have their own ideas of heaven and hell. But on one central point, all religions unite. Death is only the beginning of a new existence. Hard evidence for this belief is at best elusive. But in our program tonight, a retired bingo caller from Birmingham claims to provide that evidence. You soldiers all that now are... This is it! This is it! Peter, Bob and Carl are brothers from Birmingham, all on a mission. Oh, this is Does definitely the church, without the a shadow of a doubt. Their quest to unearth details of Peter's claimed past life as John Raphael, a soldier in the English Civil War of the 17th century. While I live not where I love. About um, 20 years ago, I really became interested in hypnosis. My brother Peter's daughter-in-law uh, agreed to come along for a session. Well, she dropped out for whatever reason. Time travel has long been a source of endless fascination, from H.G. Wells's The Time Machine to Hollywood films like Back to the Future. There have been some great yarns, but that's all they are, exciting fiction. However, in a special program tonight, we meet a man who claims that not only is time travel possible, but that he was employed to do it. This is not the colourful claim of a New Age mystic, but the assertion of a distinguished U.S. Army officer whose journeys into the past were carried out as part of a top-secret government programme. We saw ourselves uh, standing in the passenger cabin of this aircraft. And we kept watching this aircraft explode. We would be asked to go back again to the moment just before it exploded. We'd be able to try to pinpoint where this explosion took place. In 1988, David Morehouse, a major in the United States Army, was assigned to a new post at a top secret unit of military intelligence. Discreetly housed in two wooden sheds on an army base at Fort Meade in Maryland, the unit was so clandestine that Morehouse didn't discover what went on there until he met his commanding officer. Peering at me across the top of his knuckles, he said, what we do here, young man, is select and train individuals to transcend time and space. Now that you're in the room, change your perspective, move up. to view persons, places, or things remote in time and space, and to gather and report intelligence information on the same. And when he said that, I nearly fell out of the chair. David Morehouse was an outstanding young officer with an exceptional record. 
A company commander with the Rangers, the Army's elite fighting division, he was destined to wear stars. But four months prior to reporting to Fort Meade, Morehouse's glittering career nearly ended. During a training exercise in the Jordanian desert, a stray round struck him in the head. The bullet should have killed him, but miraculously it lodged in his helmet. As he lay unconscious on the desert floor, Morehouse claims he had a vision of an angel bearing a message. The words that were given to me were essentially this. You have chosen the wrong path in life and you are to choose a new path and that is to be a path of peace. I had no idea what those kinds of words meant. I was not some starry-eyed new age guru. I was a shaved head ranger, company commander, special operations infantryman. After the accident, Morehouse began to be haunted by a series of terrifying hallucinations and out-of-body experiences. The nightmarish episodes kept coming more and more frequently. I felt I was out of control. I could not handle this on my own anymore. In desperation, Morehouse consulted an army psychologist, fully expecting to be diagnosed as mentally ill. Take a look at these. Let me know what you think in the morning. To his amazement, Morehouse discovered that far from being invalided out of the army, he was being recruited as a psychic spy. Night, sir. The psychologist suspected that the blow from the bullet had released a latent psychic ability. Late into the night, Morehouse pored over the transcripts from Operation Grill Flame, a covert espionage program. There was an individual referred to as a monitor and an individual referred to as a viewer. The viewer was describing events, persons and places distant in time and space to the monitor. One of the most chilling accounts was reading the viewer saying to the monitor, I think I'm outside the building where you want me to be now. What are your directions? And the monitor saying to the viewer, pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room. Pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room. Those were hair-raising words. For 20 years, the US government had invested millions of dollars into a series of ultra-classified projects like Operation Grill Flame. Psychics were recruited to gather military intelligence through a process called remote viewing. Morehouse first learned to control his brainwaves to enter an altered or semi-hypnotic state, unlocking the door to the unconscious. Then, as his mind separated from his physical body, he claims he was able to remote view, to travel in time and space, and view people and events from the past. And I would drop through this tunnel, and the sensation was so physically overwhelming to me that often I, I began to get nausea. Having entered an altered state, the remote viewer is ready to begin his assignment. The monitor gives him the coordinates of the target. Your coordinates are 2175 and 0169. Access the target and describe its location. The coordinates are random. They don't relate to any physical object. They simply act as a psychic map reference, the essential trigger for a remote viewer. You begin to drop into this target area and things become perceivable by you. Uh, you're seeing the colors, you're smelling the smells and tasting things. Now move 200 feet to your right. The monitor begins steering you around in this particular target area and you actually move uh, about in the target area in this ghost-like phantom form that's projected forward or backward in time and space. And that's what a remote viewing session is like. After 18 months intensive training, Morehouse became fully operational. He now began to work on highly sensitive targets, political and military. In February 1988, US Marine Lieutenant Colonel William Higgins, working for the United Nations in Beirut, was taken hostage. In order to get me released, these... A year later, the CIA put an urgent question to the remote viewing unit at Fort Meade. 
Was Higgins alive or dead? Warhouse and his colleagues set to work. 